Welcome back, everybody. We're here for episode six of North of the Six. No pun intended on that one there. I'm Brad. This is Mike. Uh, we've got two categories to talk to you about today, but they're both going to be very in-depth. Our first one we're going to discuss today is just the state of the Toronto Blue Jays. We are now almost one month into the season, and the question we've got is, after about a month into the season, do you as a Blue Jays fan feel optimistic about the season or are you more of a pessimist or do you have a realistic expectations of what the team is going to look like moving forward all right so brad you sure don't want to talk about the winnipeg jets decision to start jansen harkins on the fourth line tonight you don't have a half an hour discussion about that Hey, Jansen Harkins, he's former Prince George Cougar. He was really good in the WHL. Uh, we, we don't need to get into that, though. I, I'll pass on that. Yeah, okay. Uh, that's what I thought. Uh, getting back to the Jays, if I'm, if I'm looking at it kind of through these three different lenses, you know, pessimistic, realistic, optimistic, if I started as a pessimist, what I would observe so far in the season has just been absolutely horrible defense. It's been awful. Uh, Bo Bichette looks like he can't make a throw to first. Um, Kevin Biggio has really struggled. The whole left side of that infield has really been terrible defensively. Um, so as a pessimist, that's what I'm seeing so far in the field. Like It's been downright awful. But what I'm also seeing is that Charlie Montreal can't manage his team. Um, he looks just, again, happy to be there. He looks stunned. He doesn't look to make the right decisions late in the games. Um, you know, guys are down late in the game, not making the late inning substitutions that are helping the team. Um, so Charlie Montoyo, to me, has been horrible so far as a manager. I'm also thinking, will this team set a record for most strikeouts in a single season? Yeah, huge swing and miss, ton of strikeouts so far in the season. Swinging looks like for a home run every single time. Most of the offense has been solo or two run home runs pretty much to start the season. So by the end of the season, how many strikers is this team going to have in total? And Teoscar Hernandez isn't even in the lineup right now. Um, so I kind of just seeing an immature team that's not ready to be yet as pessimist. Well, my pessimistic point of view, that's a, a good point in regards to uh, the fielding problems. Yeah, the games I've watched this year, they're having a... Forget uh, Vladimir Guerrero, you know, stretching off the bag, you know, trying to uh, bail these guys out on throws. Um, they need guys to make the throws. I'm seeing so many balls from the left side of the infield being, uh, you know, short throws or just not getting there on time or being thrown away. Um, all of the above is happening. That's a big problem. But I'm going to look at it from a different point of view. The amount of guys that have been on the injured list this year, I mean, my Lord, there's been so many. I mean, Julian Merriweather's uh went down and he hasn't pitched since i thought he was going to be the closer of the future for this team ross stripling's been on there george romano has been on there george springer still hasn't played he still hasn't played a game so you know i remember when you said last episode two weeks away from me two weeks away is that the jays philosophy with managing these players don't get me wrong i really value health I want guys to be 100 percent. but i mean come on like are they serious about wanting to contend this year that's my pessimistic point of view of the team this season yeah like you mentioned some of these injuries like and a lot of these injuries is like core muscle injury like a guy like springer i don't want to knock on him but you know you sign that big deal and it's like he didn't get his body ready for the year you know an oblique strain like do they have to start in the scouting reports look for guys that have allergies are they sneezing too much pulling muscles sneezing like what what is happening like how i don't understand the oblique injury it comes back from that and then it's a quadricep injury like how are you not getting yourself game ready um yeah, i just don't get it to conclude with this if everything falls apart for this team they could you know finish with oh my gosh like i will even say 70 wins you know and it just could be one of those years where it's just um it just wasn't meant to be We're, with injuries or you know maybe we overvalued the team but for now, let's flip the coin. Let's be optimistic on this one. Let's assume everything goes well. Um, if everything goes well for this team, the Jays could win, you know, 88, 89, 90 games. Vladimir Guerrero certainly looked like an AL MVP so far. Um, if George Springer comes back and he looks like the exact player he was for Houston, that could be a big boost to the team. That, that'd be like a trade deadline acquisition in a way, right? And if the Jays are in contention, you know, come the end of June, and then they go after that key starting pitcher, much like the 2015 team with David Price, then all of a sudden, they're right there again. 
Yeah, I have them, you know, 92, maybe even 94 wins on the optimistic side of you. And you mentioned George Springer coming back. Again, obviously would be a major boost. I look at a guy like Nate Pearson. If I'm an optimist and Nate Pearson comes back within the next couple of weeks, it takes off and it's in consideration for rookie of the year, right? And I look at guys like Steven Matz and Robbie Ray. They have career years, right? They might get close to 200 innings, have ERAs below four, be like solid number two. So then you start looking at that rotation behind Ryu. It's like Pearson solid year as uh you know in his first full season and then Matt's and Ray solid behind him that's a solid four in the rotation right there so to me um optimistically yeah they win the division maybe even 92 94 wins uh the bullpen stays hot the offense gets more well-rounded guys start picking it up uh Simeon's off to a slow start he tears off because he's getting he's on that one-year deal so optimistically yeah for sure I think they can win the division um if you want to, if you want to uh, speak to that, and then we'll kind of get to more of a realistic point of view. Oh, well, I was going to say Stephen Matz has looked absolutely incredible. I think he's got four wins already and leads the American League presently as of uh, this date here, and uh, it's been absolutely just remarkable what he's been able to do. So we gotta love that, and I'm sure fans across the country are um, enjoying to see that with him. Now, fans, this is going to be a little bit of an emotional roller coaster. We took you all the way down. Now we're going to take you all the way up. Now we're going to try to bring it back to an even playing field here. I'm still going to go and go with my gut on this. I still think the Jays somehow, some way, are going to finish second in the American League East. I do think it's going to be 83 wins. I did, the divisions looked very mediocre so far this year. The Yankees have been um, stunningly bad the first month of the season but um again they they have the opportunity to turn things around certainly um but you know with the state of the american league i still don't think the red Sox are for real i will look at this again in another month or two i still think they can squeak out you know, 83 wins get second place I, I see the tampa bay rays winning 81 82 i think it's gonna be very close and um the Red Sox and the Orioles still finishing fourth and fifth. I still think when all is said and done, the Jays will be in that 83 um, win territory. Yeah, as a realist, I have them right around that number two, 83, 84, maybe 85, but somewhere in that range. Again, I, I, Boston still has a solid offense, but the rotation's not going to hold up. Unless, again, they go make some key accusations, um, acquire some players at the deadline. I don't think that rotation's going to hold up for a full year, so I see them come kind of coming back down to earth and again Baltimore is not ready yet but um as a realist if I'm a Jays fan you know Springer comes back you know he puts up his career averages maybe a guy like Randall Gritchick stays hot for the year and finally kind of has that breakout year and you know the offense is good not great again I feel like we overvalued them a little bit or people were at least in the spring uh but I think the offense um I think will come around and you know get that batting average and the on-base percentage up um, and then again, you're getting some key players back from injury. I mean, we mentioned Springer, but again, other guys coming back against so many injuries so far. So as a realist, I think they can be, you know, top four in the AL uh, when it comes to offense. And again, if the rotation, you know, can hold up, I think I think the, they'll be okay there. So realistically, I, where I think we're both around the same page, 83, 84 wins, somewhere in there. So fans, let us know, are you pessimistic on the season are you optimistic on the season or are you realistic let us know shifting categories to a major major event happening soon the nfl draft is coming upon us so mike and i are going to tell you our professional opinions on how we think the top five picks are going to pan through as well as takes on our teams the baltimore ravens and pittsburgh steelers as well as the local team here with the buffalo bills so, with the number one pick in the NFL draft, the Jacksonville Jaguars select Ryan Leaf. No, I'm just kidding. It's going to be Trevor Lawrence. That's a no-brainer. The kid's been viewed as the next Peyton Manning. Um, Urban Meyer's there as the head coach now. Um, Jaguars are looking to acquire some talent around him. It's just a no-brainer pick. Yeah, I can't see a situation where they don't draft Trevor Lawrence. And again, the Jaguars kind of start that turnaround and you know become a contender again starts with the quarterback position they thought they had that in Blake Bortles uh, years back didn't really happen so again they're not hoping for another Blake Bortles and they're obviously not hoping for a guy like a Blaine Gabbard who was a first round bust 10th overall back you know in, in around 2012 so 
Yeah, it's got to be Trevor Lawrence, number one. Then it starts to open up a little bit here after that pick. And again, the Trevor Lawrence pick's a no-brainer. Number two, the New York Jets. They gave up on Sam Darnold after three years. No surprise there. And they it's clear they need a quarterback. I think they're going to go with Zach Wilson from BYU. And why? I think he's got a confidence about him that I think the New York Jets are going to like. And he's just a good smart quarterback who's got a good arm i know he's had a little bit of you know off-field issues but i think he could just be the next guy for them and they're willing to give him a shot yeah i got zach wilson here as well because his pre-draft ranking is going through the roof right now uh you look at him this time last year wasn't really on the radar at all right and then what he's done in the last three four months has been outstanding he's shooting up draft boards um, so I've got him there as well. I, I think the Jets will really like his playmaking ability. You mentioned also the smarts. I think he is an upgrade over Darnold. We saw some very, very poor decisions by Sam Darnold in his first three years. So I think they like his kind of uh, cool demeanor uh, under pressure as well. So I got, uh, I got Zach Wilson there as well. With the third overall pick, the San Francisco 49ers did that mega trade to acquire that pick. And it certainly left the future of Jimmy Garoppolo in question for sure. Because uh, in episode three, uh, Mike and I discussed this. We definitely think that the 49ers are going to take a quarterback. Like I, I would be shocked if they don't take a quarterback with this pick. So I think they are going to go with Trey Lance. And why? Kyle Shanahan has stated that he wants a quarterback that can move. This kid is similar to what Colin Kaepernick and Lamar Jackson can provide. And I think that's just what they want. They want a quarterback that can be a dual threat. And I think that's ultimately why they did the trade. Yeah, Lance, like Wilson, again, has been moving up draft boards a lot. Uh, you looked at Trevor Lawrence and, you know, again, a few months ago, he might have been considered only the only quarterback in the top five. And now Wilson's into the picture. Trey Lance, you just mentioned, in the picture as well. I think they go with Justin Fields out of Ohio State, but that's if they trade Jimmy G. I just, again, I don't understand the situation. We talked about this a few episodes back. Like, if you're keeping Jimmy G, but you also trade it up, I, I just don't know how that's going to work. Are they going to go and try and get, like, a Jamar Chase, a receiver, a guy for um, Jimmy G, if they're going to keep him? We already look at that. It's a pretty decent receiving core. So... I think they trade Jimmy G and they draft a guy like Justin Fields. I know Shannon said, you know, he loves Jimmy G, but that's kind of the situation I think might play out. Unless, is there an offensive lineman out there they really like, or what is it? <laughs> Penny Sewell, again, is probably the top offensive lineman. Uh, but he's been, you know, as low as 14, 15 in some drafts, so I don't know if they go for him. Um, so, yeah, that, that's a tough one, number three. Well... We'll certainly have to see. I, I still think they're going to go quarterback, obviously. But uh, you, you never know. Crazy things happen in the draft. Um, with the number four pick, though, the Atlanta Falcons are an interesting spot. A lot of mock drafts have the first four picks being quarterback, 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 quarterback. I don't think they're going to do that. I think they're going to just stack up that offense more. I think they're going to go with tight end Kyle Pitts. And why I think they're going to do that is Matt Ryan's still a good quarterback. I think he has two years left on his deal. Why not utilize him? See what they can do. He's got two stud receivers in Julio Jones and uh, Calvin Ridley. So throw tight the best tight end available in the draft, Kyle Pitts, into that offense. And just go pound for pound with the New Orleans Saints and Tampa Bay Buccaneers in their division. Yeah, I don't think they're going quarterback either. I know people might look at them five years down the road after Matt Ryan's retired and say, why did you draft a Mac Jones or a Justin Fields if he was available? Like, what were you guys thinking? But I really do think they can get a lot out of Matt Ryan. So I just mentioned Penn Sewell, an offensive lineman. I could see him going uh, number four to Atlanta. I really could. Um, just helps beef up that offensive line. He can start right away. He's going to add you know, valuable pr protection for a guy like Matt Ryan who is aging. But yeah, I think Atlanta thinks they, you know, they got a good three, four years left in Matt Ryan. Yeah. So I, I think they, well, yeah. So we're sort of on the same page. I think they just stack up on offense, right? But speaking of Panay so well, I think he's going to go fifth to Cincinnati. And why? All you have to do is watch the tape of the Joe Burrow injury last year. That's all you need to know. 
Yeah, that would that would definitely make sense for them if he's available. I think he's definitely an option. I think they go for another receiving weapon for Joe Burrow. And, and here's where I think Jamar Chase comes in. Again, you can pair him with Tyler Boyd, T. Higgins, up and coming receivers. If you look at those three guys that they drafted, Chase, that goes in probably top three, four receiving core in the league right away. Again, they do need some protection for Burrow, uh, but I don't think you can pass up on a talent like Jamar Chase if he's available at number five. See, here's where I'm going to challenge you on this one. I just said, watch the tape of the Joe Burrow injury last year. They have no offensive line. I think, you know, it'd be great to have another wide receiver. Sure, that'd be fine. But if Joe Burrow has no time to throw the ball, then what's the point of having another receiver? Yeah, they may look elsewhere to short that offensive line. You may look for trades, even draft day or make a signing, something like that. So I still think they need to address it. But I think Burrow, deep down, those, those quarterbacks love talented receivers. I know they love their offensive linemen. They love being protected. They love some talented receivers. So I wouldn't be surprised if they go Jamar Chase. Okay, fine. But, you, but you, you know, you're an AFC North guy. I'm an AFC North guy. Uh, you know those front sevens Joe Burrow has to go up against? Even Cleveland Browns front seven? Yeah, it's scary. <laughs> yeah, you don't want you don't want your every regular dose of Miles Garrett uh, or TJ Watt coming at you, right? So. Yeah, I know. So, well, you know what? We'll just see what they do. That's, I'm just going to leave it at that. We'll see what they do. Um, we're going to go to the local team quickly here, the Buffalo Bills. I think they're one, maybe two pieces away from being a legit championship contender. This team is good. They are really good. I think they need a little help on defense. I think they're going to go after Asante Samuel Jr., the cornerback from Florida State. And why? That AFC game against Kansas City, Patrick Mahomes was just having a May Day all over them. And I'm, the Buffalo Bills still put up a ton of points in that game, but the defense really got exposed. And I think that's just all they need. They just need a little bit more help in that secondary. And then I think they're a Super Bowl contender. They're close. I would agree with that. They're very close. And again, one or two pieces, I think, puts them, you know, Super Bowl bound. I'm going to look on the other side of the ball, though. And I think they go after one of those three running backs that I think will be available late first round, early second round. Um, whether that's Travis Etchin, uh, Najee Harris, Javante Williams. Uh, one of those three. Uh, I, I don't think they have a ton of faith in Devin Singletary after two years. Zach Moss, again, they're not quite sure what they have. Is he going to be more of an in-between the tackle, third down back? So I think they go after one of these running backs. Okay, so just yeah, just beef up the offense even more. I, I th you know what? That could very well happen. Let's. I'll like, leave this one to you. What are your Pittsburgh Steelers going to do? I know you were uh, really hard on them with the their free agency period, but I, they certainly have time to make it up in the draft. What do you think they're going to do with their first pick? The first thing I want to address is the Mike Tomlin three-year extension. What a complete joke that is. Uh, <laughs> like, I, I don't understand it. I just, I don't get it. Uh, at some point, you have to realize year after year, they're underperforming. Uh, they're coming short. Uh, they have their shortcomings in the playoffs. Losing to inferior teams. At some point, that's got to come back to the coach. I know the coach doesn't throw the ball or make a tackle, but his playoff record, he's won one playoff game in the last 10 years. I know Pittsburgh's got the loyal loyalty to their coaches. They've had three head coaches in the last 50 years. Like, I get that, but at some point, you got to move on. It's like Masai Ujiri with the DeMar DeRozan. Like, we can't just keep doing the same thing over and over again and have the same results. There's got to be a change at some point. And I don't understand that extension, but looking at the draft, I think they need to address either the running back position or offensive line. The offensive line was weaker last year. I don't think it's terrible, but Mar uh, Marquise Pouncey retiring obviously doesn't help. The Castro's aging a little bit. Probably going to lose Villanueva at left tackle. So it would be nice to, to beef up that O-line. I think they do that in the second and third rounds. First round, I think, similar to the Buffalo Bills, they're going to go after one of these running backs. Uh, Najee Harris, I would love the Steelers to get this explosive back. Um, he would just bring a whole new dimension to that offense. You know, maybe they focus a little bit more on the run than like they did last year. James Conner was, you know, a feel-good story. Uh, he had some decent uh, runs with the Steelers, but there's no real big loss there. So I think they need an upgrade at the running back position. How about I, your Baltimore Ravens? Well, first of all, your Steelers, I completely agree on that. They, you know... They are always known as the ground and pound run, you know, run first type team. Steel Curtain, they need to get, uh, upgrade a running back for sure. 
my Baltimore Ravens, well, they just threw a blockbuster trade out of nowhere. Orlando Brown Jr., their right tackle, was traded to Kansas City for, um, it was a bit of a complicated deal that involved six picks and the player. Um, I wasn't surprised that it happened because he did tweet out back in January that I'm a left tackle. And with Ronnie Stanley coming back to play for left tackle for the Ravens, it made him expend- expendable. So he was traded to Kansas City. And they, with that, they got a uh, first round pick in return. So they have the 27th and 31st picks in round one of the draft, which is great. I think, though, with the 27th pick, they've done this in years past. I think they're going to trade down and accumulate, try to get another pick or two in there, try to get a second and as well as a fourth, maybe a fifth or a sixth in there. There's a lot of talent in this draft. I certainly think I think they're going to trade down and get rid of that 27th pick to accumulate more picks. Um, Eric DaCosta and Ozzie Newsom, they love having tons of picks. The Ravens are always up there, the top three, top four teams of having the most picks. They like to find those diamonds in the rough, if you want to call it that, you know, in the fourths and fifths rounds, and just try to accumulate as much talent as possible. With the 31st um, pick, well, I think they're sorry, gonna, going to... Uh, sorry, I think they're going to replace Orlando Brown and draft the offensive tackle from Alabama. His name is Alex Leatherwood. And the Ravens just have a history of going after those guys from Alabama, and I think they'll just plug them right in there at right tackle. And, and going back to that 27th pick, I think that pick will again will just be traded for future picks for days two and days three of the draft. I think the Ravens might need to look for an edge rusher, right? something on the D line. Obviously, losing Matt Judon and Yannick Ngakwe, right? There's a couple big holes there, so I think they might look like they have with the Steelers, you know, in drafts past defense, defense first round. I think Steelers 13 in the last 15 years have been, you know, they've drafted a defensive player in the first round. So I think the Ravens. Again, look for a defensive guy in the first round. Yeah, and, I, and that's and that's why I think they'll definitely do in rounds two, rounds three. I think they'll take their chances and you know looking at tier two talent out there and try to find a diamond in the rough or two. Right? I think they'd rather have um, quantity over quality if that makes sense. But if they can, they like to improve their chances of hitting more home runs if that makes sense, rather than putting all their eggs in one basket. However. Um, they do certainly have a need of edge rushers, so we'll see. Hey, thank you, fans, for joining us for this episode of North of the Six. We hope you continue to take care of your loved ones, stay safe out there, and we look forward to seeing you again soon. Yeah, hit us up on all our social platforms, guys. Uh, we'll get North of the Six trending. Certain topics, leave a message. You want you smile. You're just smiling. Uh, just honestly, no. We'll just we'll just get him to cut it after yours, and that's good enough.